就他想起。On the autumnal equinox, the Shu family in Longhu village offer an autumn sacrifice in their ancestral hall. Offerings of chicken, fish, meat and fruit are placed on the altar. Unlike other families, the Shu family have set up another altar next to the niche, on which they have placed even more offerings. Some graveyards in Longhu village remain nameless, owing to the tumultuous end of the northern Song dynasty. It was many years later, in the Ming dynasty, that the Shu family decided to build their own ancestral hall. Our forefathers wanted to give thanks because they took some land formerly inhabited by the aborigines to build the ancestral hall. It became customary to make two offerings every spring and autumn equinox. We have been doing this for 600 years. Everyone follows the tradition. The ancestral hall was named Gratitude Hall, and here descendants are taught to forget favors given and remember those received. In a show of thanks to the aborigines, the Shu family laid the tiles onto the ground around the niche, without sealing them in. So if they ever came back, the aborigines would still recognize the land. This has become an unwritten rule in the Shu family, which is still respected today. People from Chaozhou always show gratitude to whomever once helped them. We show our gratitude through worship. For the well, we have the gods of the well. We call them well father and well mother. For the beds our children sleep on, there is the god of the bed. We worship it too. Forgetting favors given and remembering those received is a traditional Chinese virtue and has long been Longhu villagers' life philosophy. Longhu village lies southeast of Chawan district in Chaozhou, Guangdong. It was built towards the end of the Northern Song Dynasty and was once named Tanghu after the surrounding ponds and lakes. The name was changed to Longhu in the Ming Dynasty. The village runs from north to south and looks like a band from above. Its layout and gate were made to resemble those of a small city. Its design and architecture are typical of many ancient villages in Chaozhou, hence the name Little Chaozhou. One can see row upon row of houses, among which are 40 mansions and three official residences. The style is an integration of the Song, Ming, Qing, and Republic of China. Buildings are decorated with wood and stone carvings, porcelain, painted details and sculptures. 58-year-old Huang Li Hao has come to Lady Temple early today. The Huangs worship their ancestors every ninth day of the 12th lunar month. Huang Li Hao is making preparations before the rest of the family arrives. Everything is ready. 
Wang Li Hao invites the foremost family members to help him hang a portrait of their great-great-grandmother. It is almost as old as the hall, which is now 350 years old. This kind old lady was once the owner of the ancestral hall, Lady Zhou. Her son, Huang Yu, built Lady Temple. He was once a famous merchant in Chaoshan. He says he was able to marry, all thanks to his mother and her hard-nosed parenting. Women in Chaozhou are known for their excellent character. They help their husbands and teach their children as well. When they marry, they completely devote themselves to looking after their husbands and raising their children. It can be said it's a lifelong career. In return, children shower their mothers with adoration and respect, and they feel it is only right that they show their mothers just how grateful they are to them. Building an ancestral hall is this gratitude made concrete. It is how the people of Chaozhou show respect for Chaozhou women. But building the ancestral hall was not easy for Huang Tsoyu. He wanted to make sure future generations would continue to worship his mother. Huang Tsoyu shouldered everything. He paid for the construction of the ancestral hall. He only had one request to make in exchange. He asked that once the hall was finished, a memorial tablet of his mother be placed inside the hall in order to venerate the woman. Now, at first the clan made him a promise that it would be done. But after the ancestral hall's construction had reached completion, they told Huang Tso Yu that his father's concubine could not be worshipped there. As a mother loves her children, so should they love her. Huang Tso Yu felt so strongly about this that he knew he had to show his mother his gratitude. And so, ignoring the protests of his clan, Huang Tso Yu went on to have Lady Temple built. In ancient times, building scales and proportions corresponded to the people that they were built for. According to custom, the width of the entryway of Lady Temple should be equal to one-third of the entire building. Huang Tso Yu designed it to measure two-thirds, in accordance with just how much he thought his mother did for him. Both of the ancestral halls he commissioned have a stepping stone. Each stone is eight meters long, weighing about 6,000 kilograms, yet another symbol to commemorate mothers. In this way, Huang Tso Yu not only comforted his mother in heaven, but because of him, villagers could now put women's memorial tablets in halls as well. Huang Li Hao is Huang Tso Yu's 12th generation descendant. At 17, he went to nearby Dongfang town to look after his grandmother. He only came back to the village 17 years later when she passed away. In honor of his filial piety, the clan elected him successor of the portrait in 2002, even if he was not the eldest son. When I took over as successor of the portrait, I was told to burn incense morning and night for the ancestors. Uh, it is part of our family instructions. Instructions? That's right. How old are the family instructions? We've had the family instructions since the hall was built. Ever since it was first hung, the portrait of Lady Zhou, Huang Tso Yu's mother, has been worshipped by descendants every year, while Huang elders tell their progeny about ancestors giving back to their parents. Thus, the spirit of filial piety is passed on. Requite favors with gratitude and show compassion. Those who are grateful know how to cherish, and those who cherish will be happy. These are simple truths known by all in Longhu village. A man is preparing sweet and crispy candy that is a famous snack in Chaozhou. Huang Li Wu is a traditional candy craftsman. Twenty years ago, the mother of a woman named Lin Hui Shang remarried a candy maker named Huang Zhongzhe. Huang Zhongzhe looked after Lin Hui Shang 
as if she were his own daughter. When Lin Huishang's mother died two years later, he raised Lin Huishang by himself. As a sign of gratitude, Lin Huishang made the bold decision to ask her then-boyfriend, Huang Liwu, to marry into her family, to help her look after her stepfather and help him with the candy-making business. By then, her stepfather was tired from all the hard work, and it was Lin Weishang's idea to help her stepfather keep the candy business running. His candy shop was very famous, so my father-in-law thought that it would be a shame if he had to close the shop, which had been doing so well. So Huang Zhongzhe taught his son-in-law Huang Li Wu how to make the crunchy candy. Now armed with this skill, Wang Li Wu could support a family. One year later, Wang Li Wu and Lin Hui Shang married and had children of their own. In gratitude to his father-in-law, Wang Li Wu decided to take on all the candy-making work. At work, he is his mentor's successor, and at home, he is a doting son-in-law. I treat him like he is my own son. In fact, I think he's even better than a son. Better than a son. Because he is always by my side. In 2013, Wang Junse had to go to Guangzhou hundreds of kilometers away for heart surgery. Wang Liwu never left his side. He grew thin from the harrowing days. His daughter, who worked in Guangzhou, remembers his devotion. He would buy vegetables, then he would go home to cook them, then he would bring them to my grandfather. It was only after that that he could eat. He kept my grandfather company in the hospital. And when he could, he would go back home to prepare more food for my grandfather. My father was very devoted to him. He never left his side and made sure my grandfather always had home-cooked food. It is gratitude that happily binds these people together, even though they are not related by blood. Longhu villagers like tea. Tea is a symbol for heaven, water for earth, the stove for father, and the pot for mother. Drinking tea is a way of remembering heaven, earth, and one's parents. In Longhu village, there are many ancestral halls. There are exactly 56 ancestral halls and temples with verifiable literature. The ancestral hall is where the clan gathers to worship their ancestors. Normally, there is either one or a few family names in the village. So why does this 15,000 square meter village have so many halls? According to records, in ancient times, before the alluvial plain in the Hanjiang River came into being, Longhu was easily accessed. Back then, it was a shipping and freight station for Chaochou and its neighbors. It was also a port. Over time, it slowly grew very prosperous, and the port became a commercial port. There are normally large outsider populations in commercial ports. More outsiders, therefore, means more surnames. According to records, there were originally 43 surnames in Longhu village. Today, there are 21. For centuries, the clans in the village have lived in harmony. This is most likely an effect of the principle of forgetting favors given and remembering those received. Long ago, there was once a teacher in Longhu village who had eight students. His students wished to honor him, so they and their descendants continued to worship him for the next 400 years. In the Ming Dynasty, during Wan Li's reign, there were seven different clans who invited Mr. Wang Don Chu to teach here. He was a good teacher. And because of this, his eight students went on to do very well in their academics. But Mr. Wang did not marry nor have any children, no. So his students decided to repay their teacher by providing for him and later attending his funeral. When he passed away, they raised funds to build an ancestral hall for him so they could worship him. 
In addition, seven of the students put up tablets for Mr. Wang's father. And the last student, Mr. She, who also had no children, so they could be worshipped. This story of gratitude was recorded in the genealogies of the seven students' families. When the teacher's hall was repaired in the Qing dynasty, the magistrate of Chaozhou had an inscription made. When the magistrate of Chaozhou was first invited to make an inscription, he refused to do it. But then the whole story was recounted to him. The ancestral hall was built in Wanli's reign in the Ming dynasty. It was 200 years before Emperor Qianlong, 18 generations. The hall was in disrepair, but the seven clans held on to their legacy. They were taught to worship the great teacher and that they should not forget the gratitude their ancestors had for him. In this spirit, the 18th generation descendants raised funds to repair the ancestral hall. The magistrate of Chaozhou was moved by this and then decided to have this inscription made. The man who teaches me is a lifelong father figure. Remarkable. You were taught by a man, and then he becomes a father figure, and you'll consider him so for life. And you should build an ancestral temple for him, because he has no children. It is the right thing to do. People in Chaozhou see this as a sign of reverence for knowledge and education. So you see, the ancestral hall is the material embodiment of, of that reverence. Records show hundreds of imperial scholars having come from the village since it was first built. For such a small village, this is a rather impressive number. This is most likely due to the villagers' regard for their teachers and their deep sense of gratitude for them. Gratitude begins from within, but the act of giving back begins with practice. For Long Hu villagers, gratitude must come from the heart. This is Liu Chaopeng. He's an ordinary 53-year-old farmer from the village. The old paralyzed man is Liu Ku Chong, 80 years old. They may share the same last name, but the two are merely neighbors. I am Liu Chaopeng's neighbor. The old man cannot get up, Liu Chaopeng helps him to eat, to bathe, take his medicine, to go to the bathroom. Liu Kajong depends on him for everything. For the past two years, Liu Kajong has not been able to get up from bed. He bathes, eats, and goes to the bathroom here, and has bed sores. But the small six-square-meter room is well kept and clean. Can you tell us how he takes care of you? He said I'm attentive. You are attentive. Liu Kajong is unable to say more. But we can understand what he wants to say from the tears in his eyes. He said I bring him food after work. I always feed him before I eat. Despite a 30-year age gap, Liu Kajong and Liu Chaopeng call each other brother, being of the same generation. When Liu Chaopeng was a little, he remembers his elder brother always sharing some of his meat with them. He also filled both families' water vats. Once, when Liu Chaopeng fell ill, Liu Kejong carried him all the way to the town hospital on his back in the rain. His elder brother's help and small acts of kindness made a lasting impression on Liu Chaopeng over time. As the saying goes, a little help brings much in return. Liu Kajong never married and has no living relatives. Since he became paralyzed, Liu Chaopeng and his wife have taken it upon themselves to care for him. We didn't think much of it. We just brought him food because we lived next door. Liu Chaopeng wanted to repay his neighbor for his kindness. The distance between the two houses is less than 10 meters. But because of the separating wall, Liu Chaopeng had to make a detour every day before entering Liu Kejong's room. Liu Chaopeng came up with a solution and created a door that would connect their homes. 
What did it look like before the door was here? It was just one large wall, all the way across. Is it more convenient now with the door? Of course it is. Much more convenient. After the door was made, it became easier to care for him. Now they do not have to go around anymore. I just measured it. Now from Liu Kejong's room to here, it is 36 steps. From here, walking to Liu Chaopong's gate, it takes 16 steps. And then it takes another 36 steps from the gate to the old man's room. Ever since the door was made through the wall, it only takes 24 steps from one room to the other. It is shorter. From what we can see, the 24 steps have not only decreased the physical distance between them, they have also served to bring the families even closer together. They are more connected now. When a door is created in a wall between neighbors, it is a rather special thing. Our homes are normally closed off. And that is because we want to have a certain degree of privacy in our homes. Now that we understand that, what does it mean to build a door? It is a symbol of one's gratitude, bringing two families together and breaking down old stereotypes. A distant relative is not as good as a close neighbor. In the city, you live in apartments, so you lock your door, and I lock mine. People come in and out through stairs and elevators. Everyone is a stranger, even if they are under the same roof. You go about your day without seeing anyone, and no one really knows anyone anymore because of it. If you ask me, this should change. Here in Chaozhou, there is still rapport among neighbors, and they live together in harmony. It is this friendly rapport among neighbors that I believe is worth emulating. Villagers believe that a little help brings much in return. Liu Chaopang is showing his gratitude. Another local, Li Huiji, shares similar sentiments for his fellow villagers. 51-year-old Li Huiji left Longhu to make a living in Hainan. He has been working there for 28 years, but still comes back to the village every year for ancestor worship. I will show you the room where we were all born. My seven siblings and I were born right here. All of you? Yes, that is right. Li Huiji's father died when he was only 11. He was survived by eight children. It was very difficult for them. But Li Huiji remembers people were always there to help. My older brother got sick. He had a high fever. We did not have enough money to see a doctor, and we were so worried. So then my neighbor came over with two yuan. He handed it to my mother and told her not to worry and not to cry. But she cried anyway. <laughs> I remember how the tears were streaming down her face. <laughs> Thus, Li Huiji's mother always reminded her children not to forget the kindness of fellow villagers. Li Huiji tells his sons how he and his family lived through the hardship with the help of his relatives, friends, and neighbors. He also tells them how his mother taught her eight children to show their gratitude. Every year when I come back to the village to sweep the tombs, I bring my two sons along with me. I always tell them that they should remember to be diligent and conscientious. And of course, I remind them that they should be kind and uh, show their gratitude. Um, because it is very important. We do good deeds without expecting anything in return. But should people help us, we must always try to repay their kindness. Li Weiji remembers what his mother taught him. In order to repay his fellow villagers, Li Huiji sponsored the refurbishment of his clan's yard, the building of cement roads, and the laying of pipelines. This old lady once fractured her right leg, but she was able to get surgery with Li Huiji's help. Over the years, Li Huiji has always helped whoever is in need. Li Weiji thinks most about the three schools where he once studied. Because his family was in dire straits, he once received a tuition waiver. His teachers and classmates also offered their help. In order to repay his old schools, he donated books, equipment, and commissioned the building of dormitories. 
He also set up the Li Weiji Education Foundation to sponsor children from poor families. When he found out an old school library had been condemned, he thought of renovating it. It was built 87 years ago, and the second floor cannot be used. The library is a village landmark, and so whenever we speak of it, we get particularly emotional. It's hard not to. If nothing is done, the building collapses or is converted into something else. It will be different. There will no longer be those feelings of home. Over the years, Li Weiji has done so much for his hometown and the villagers there that it is difficult to count. He says he does it all without expecting anything in return, but so he can tell his mother what he has done for his fellow villagers when he comes to sweep her tomb every year. This is common in Chaozhou. There are two ways to look at it. One, he is grateful. He's grateful to his hometown where he grew up. Second, there is the traditional Chinese principle of accumulating virtue. In Longhu village, there is a saying, progress comes from gratitude. Villagers believe a man cannot be successful or respected unless he is grateful. Forgetting favors given, but remembering those received. In Longhu and Chaozhou, people repay kindness as best they can. Before the river was named Hanjiang, it was once called Xi. When Han Yu held office in Chaozhou, he supported farming and the establishment of schools. The river was renamed Hanjiang in his honor. The Bija Mountain Han Yu often visited was renamed Hanshan Mountain. Both names are still in use today. Climb to the mountaintop, but do not forget your parents' love. Be successful, but do not forget the kindness of your teachers. To Longhu villagers, a man's path in life will always be wider when he is truly grateful.